do I bring my faith to work? How do I tap into the power of God in my work life call? Why am I going through this adversity? Is God mad at me? I'm Oz Hillman, and I've been helping leaders like you answer these questions and more for over 30 years. And that's what this podcast is all about. Let's learn and grow together. Welcome to TGIF Today, God is First. Well, welcome everybody to this week's TGI If It Work podcast. It's uh, great to uh, be with you this week and to have a special guest, Craig Berkman. I just gotten to know Craig in the last few months and the, the passion he has for a topic that we're going to discuss today. And uh, so we're going to get right into it. Craig, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm fine. Good morning. <laughs> so Craig is founder of Free at Last Coalition. And as I was um, preparing for our conversation today, I, I began to think about how often life sends us um, some lemons. And but out of that, we come into contact with what could be our larger story in life. And I think that probably describes what has happened in Craig Berkman's life. And Craig is been a very successful businessman and entrepreneur over many years, but he had some bumps in the road that has steered him in a new direction. And so, Craig, tell us just a little background on yourself and how we got to this focus that you have today. Well, by God's grace, um, I've had the privilege of being raised, obviously, like most of us in this wonderful country. It has its <laughs> I wouldn't want to live in any other country than America. And as a result of the opportunities that this nation affords for people, I had the opportunity to get a, a first rate education. Uh, somebody once said I was educated beyond my intelligence, <laughs> um, but I went to uh, and got a degree from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, uh, got a master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley <clears throat> and, a law, <clears throat> and then a law degree. And, Along the way, I um, had a friend who was a chemist, and um, <clears throat> to make a long story short, we started a company many years ago that has turned out to be one of the 200 largest corporations now in the United States. And so at a very young age, uh, I had more money than good sense. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> in some respects, um, that um, was the precursor to uh, really not um, relying, as the scripture says, I think it's in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that we're to trust in the Lord with all our hearts, lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he'll direct our paths. Well, I didn't uh, <clears throat> follow the admonition of that scripture. And uh, as a result, um, at age 72, I got involved in a project <clears throat> that went sideways and uh, there were some adverse financial consequences to others, and they chose to go to the Security and Exchange Commission to make a complaint about it, and that led to my being incarcerated for 4.8 years. Um, and uh, the way I have come to think about it in the context of what has happened since, and at the time, frankly, uh, during that period, uh, the Lord chose to put me on an off ramp, and. Uh, as he does uh, so gently without trying to cajole us or talk us into things. Um, I think he made it abundantly clear that if I were to get back on the freeway, I needed to be back on the freeway, not going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, but uh, 100 miles an hour in the right direction, but letting him drive the car and let me be in his wake. And it was in that uh, context of that pause that uh, I read an article by a pastor who became the successor to Charles Colson when Mr. Colson became chairman of the prison fellowship, a fellow by the name of Jim Liskey. And the title of the article that was published in USA Today was entitled, Yep, uh, Slavery is Still Legal. And um, having gone to law school, I kind of thought, Wow, uh, when he published the article, he pointed out 
that there's an exception clause in the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And most lawyers, frankly, members of Congress, legislators, judges, including the lay public, haven't got a clue that the amendment that supposedly outlaws, outlawed slavery in this country at the end of the American Civil War has an exception clause that, that applies to those who are incarcerated. So that's the, um, in a long story, to make a long story relatively short, that's what prompted the organization of the Free at Last Coalition. Greg, uh, was that revelation before or after your incarceration? Um, it happened during. Um, during. Because um, this is not an academic subject with me because like those of my colleagues and I who were incarcerated, I was treated as a slave in the sense that my work had no value. Um, it was not uh, in any way compensated, even though I was doing some useful things and applying uh, the skills that I had to teach some courses to um, people to try to encourage them to provide a way for them to get some meaningful employment when they got out of incarceration. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Uh, the website is freeatlastcoalition.org. And the section one of the 13th Amendment reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, if you read that kind of on the face value of that, it almost seems like what they're saying is you cannot have slavery unless it's part of uh, restitution for their punishment. What are we missing in that, uh, that description? And what, I can see why people would draw the conclusion, well, they've, they've made the mistake. We ought to be able to use their free labor just as part of their crime. Uh, how, do, how, do we, uh, how should we translate that correctly? Well, I think having and requiring productive work for people who are incarcerated is a common sense thing. Um, but Abraham Lincoln defined slavery as one person stealing the economic value of another person's work. And uh, many of the people that are incarcerated, uh, frankly, uh, don't have many skill sets. Uh, a lot of them don't have, uh, haven't completed their education. Some of them can't read or write. Uh, so they don't go into that environment with a whole lot going for them, correct? Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you look at it from both and God's perspective in that all human beings, irrespective of where they are in their life and irrespective of the poor choices they've made, we were all created in the image of God. And to basically say to that person, um, if we teach you a skill or you're required to do certain work, about, but it, we, we don't ascribe any value of it to you, uh, we're basically saying um, our uh, criminal justice system is not about rehabilitation. It's purely mm. about, about punishment. Mm. And uh, if God himself was okay with one human being enslaving another, irrespective of the circumstances, then why did he tap Moses to be his agent to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Um, and... Uh, and you go back to the 25th chapter of Matthew in the, in the New Testament and it talks about, you know, when I was hungry and naked uh, in prison, as you did it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. And that's kind of the rationale of the talk for the Free at Last Coalition. Yeah. So uh, I met you through my wife, Pamela, who has a prison ministry and you know, she spent 18 months in prison and she she describes that time as for the first time she had freedom, freedom from those that were sexually abusing her, threatening her, freedom from drugs, et cetera. So it became, as she says, uh, 
a university for her to be able to focus on the scripture. She'd memorize scripture two and a half hours a day. And out of that birthed her ministry, lifechangerslegacy.org. And um, so as you were incarcerated, what were some of the things God really did in your life that you can look back now and say, you know, you could even be grateful for that. But how do you see that now? Well, thankfully, I had the opportunity um, through the generosity of uh, a friend on the outside and a couple of inmates on the inside to have access to the scriptures. And, uh, and thankfully, I used a lot of my time, like your wife did, um, reading the word of God and understanding perhaps for the first time in my life's experience, uh, how powerful, uh, it is. Um, you know, when you, when you think about, um, I think it's recorded in the book of Hebrews that it's, the word of God is sharper than a two edged sword. And, uh, and what does that mean? Well, you know, there is power in the word of God. Um, and I found so many times, both while I was incarcerated and since I've come out into the, uh, back to the community, that um, God's word has not only strengthened and encouraged my heart, but in a practical sense, uh, is, is not only part of my current DNA, but it's high on the, my conscious list. I, I don't go through a day, you know, saying, well, I can do this, I can do that, this is that. I, I understand fundamentally that the whole human race, whether you're a believer, or irrespective of your station in life, since God keeps the firmament in its place, uh, the ideal conditions he sets so that those of who live on planet Earth can breathe each day, he does without, you know, favor to anyone. But then when you get down to the granular level, he's at work in the hearts of each of us, especially those who have come to repentance and have acknowledged that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, as he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And uh, that was part of my odyssey. <laughs> uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish what I went through on anybody, but I think I may have shared this with you before, Oz. Um, the story of Joseph is a very compelling story for a whole variety of reasons. And we know that his um, older brothers were jealous of him, the relationship with he had his, with his father, Jacob. And, uh, and um, they were going to, you know, throw him into a... a kind of a cave or someplace like that, uh, take his coat of many colors, uh, kill an animal, spur the animal's blood around and tell his father that he'd, been, he'd lost his life to an animal, a wild animal, and then some slave traders came along, sold him into slavery. He, he went to uh, Potiphar's house and Potiphar had this very attractive, uh, sexually aggressive wife who lusted after Joseph and chased him around for years. And he, by God's grace, resisted. Finally, she lied and he was incarcerated for 14 years. You just think about 14 years in those prisons. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we're not a walk in the park. But by God's grace, he brought him out of that. And what did God do with Joseph? He made him the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. He helped to save his family literally by bringing them uh, to Egypt so they could have food. Uh, he was able to fellowship with his father. He helped to bury his father. And then there's that wonderful verse that's recorded, I believe, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, where it says to his brothers when they said, well, now that dad is gone, he's really going to give us our justice for what we did to him. And he said to his brothers, what you meant for my harm, uh, God meant for my good. And I believe that um, 
to the extent that, that God is involved with the Free at Last Coalition. There are many indices that he is blessing this ministry. Uh, he uh, allowed me to go through this experience to bring me to a point where hopefully I can be a servant to others and collectively we can rid this country of its original sin, uh, the sin of slavery, which came to these shores, interesting enough, over 400 years ago. Yeah. I want to go back to the statement you said the prison system is root, is not rooted in rehabilitation, but punishment. Recidivism, which is which means the amount of people that come back into prison after being released within three years is around 68 percent. And it really shouldn't be that way if we were focused on rehabilitation. And um, Pamela has certainly believes that with all her heart. What do you think that uh, what kinds of progress are you guys making in terms of of this issue? Uh, I want to, before you answer that, let me read something off your website. Um, the Free at Last Coalition was formed to close the slavery loophole and at last complete the course begun by Lincoln's signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Our members are committed to this most worthy cause, believing that, as Lincoln himself said in his 1854 speech in Peoria, Illinois, there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. The Free at Last Coalition was formed in response to the distressing reality that slavery is still legal in America today. More than 150 years after the Civil War ended and America believed it had resolved the question of slavery, the 13th Amendment of our Constitution continues to include a pivotal clause that amounts to an assent to slavery and involuntary servitude. This odious language in the 13th Amendment must be removed once and for all from our national charter. We therefore propose and will work to achieve amending the Constitution to eliminate the exception clause of the Section 1 of the 13th Amendment. So what you're trying to do is remove the inference that slavery is okay if it's for the purpose of uh as part of someone's crime or punishment, and that that's not a legitimate reason for them to be enslaved within prison. Kind of unpack that a little more in detail for us. Well, the reality is, from a financial perspective, the criminal justice system in the United States is really nothing more than an extension of the welfare state. Mm. The taxpayers pick up the entire tab. And if you combine the federal and state systems together, it's about an $80 billion price tag annually. Mm -hmm. And in an ideal world, you'd want to have somebody who rightfully has been taken out of the community for a period of time. And we need to remember that 97% of the people who are incarcerated come back to the community. And the question is, both from their perspective and the community's perspective is, is the community safer or is the community uh, less off when they come back out of quote unquote being rehabilitated? Mm -hmm. And if in the course of their incarceration, they had no opportunity to learn a skill, a trade, they had no opportunity to save a little money uh, or even use a little money that they might earn to pay back the taxpayer in part or their victim if they had some restitution. And when they come out and they're homeless and they're under a bridge, the statistical probability and the statistics show um, the only way they can literally survive is in their minds by going back to a life of crime and they're reincarcerated. So we get this revolving door. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we kind of think about this as, well, this doesn't really apply to many people, um, it's a shocking statistic, but it's true. 
one out of four American adults uh, have a criminal record. 75 million people in this country. Hmm. So a lot more people have been incarcerated than people realize. And it impacts not only the individual, but obviously their family, their children, their spouses, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, et cetera. So <clears throat> we, we live in kind of a unique time in the sense that right now, everywhere you go, you see help wanted signs. Um, businesses, I don't care if they're technology companies or restaurants, are having a very difficult time retaining employees and hiring new ones. And you've got, if you look at this in a macro sense, almost a million and a half people who you don't have to worry about. They're getting in a car and driving to work each day. You know where they are. <laughs> they only have to walk a few feet to do a job if the job is available for them or to get the training. And then when the training is done to get the job. And I think for the first time in American history, we have a chance to turn this prison industrial complex from nothing more than an extension of the welfare state into a public private partnership mm -hmm. where, pri where private corporations would come in as long as they could be assured that, that their personnel are safe and if they have equipment involved in making a subcomponent of a product or a product that it is well maintained and cared for, if those conditions were met, I, I think they would bear the entire cost of training. They would hire these folks. Uh, they would have an opportunity to gain some dignity. Uh, whatever they earn could be set aside in part, as I said, to pay some put it back to the taxpayers and their victims. But most importantly, when they come out, um, most likely than not, they'd have a job waiting for them because those employers, mm -hmm. uh, human resource departments would say, look, this person did a terrific work for us for a year or two or three years while they were incarcerated. Uh, we had to be hire them in a nanosecond rather than somebody just making an application off the street. So we call yeah. that a, we call that our payback pay go model, and by getting rid of the exception clause of the Thirteenth Amendment, it opens the door to allow for that. Yeah, I think if we just looked at this from a common sense standpoint on the benefit to society and the benefit to the prison system, to say that which is better, having a person over here sitting around being punished and being um, having to think about their failure in life 24 seven versus putting them in a place where they might have some dignity and value by investing in a purpose or skill or something that's generating productivity. That alone is going to change the spiritual climate of a prison and the life of those people in that prison. So it's uh, it's really should be a no brainer, but there's an awful lot of money to be had in the prison system. And unfortunately it has become a big business and the motivation to, to, you know, make these people healthy and, and productive is, is just not there for, you know, it's unfortunate. What kind of progress are we making on this initiative? Well, we are fortunate to have some very knowledgeable people who are trusted by, frankly, uh, members of both sides of the political process in Washington, D.C., uh, irrespective of if they're Democrats, Republicans, come from big states, small states, uh, representing urban areas or rural areas. And um, these uh, uh, agents, so to speak, for, uh, independent contractors uh, that we are working with have had a number of conversations um, with some of the leadership in both sides of the aisle in both the House and the Senate. And there is, first of all, uh, a surprise it's <laughs> that the, uh, this exclusion clause, they didn't even realize it was in there. <laughs> and um, you know, we, we've based this on the premise that 
no politician with a television camera cranking away or a tape recorder and a print recorder sitting across the desk from them is going to want to stand up and publicly defend slavery in 20th century, 21st century America. And the $64 question, of course, is if you get rid of the exception clause, you need to do it in such a way that you don't um, open the door for the law of unintended consequences. Um, for example, um, we're very clear that uh, able-bodied people should work as a part of their incarceration experience. So you wouldn't want somebody to come along and say, well, if the exception clause is gone, people no longer have to work in prison. That would be um, an example of the law of unintended consequences. Another example would be, you don't want to preclude the judge from saying to somebody, I'm going to give you 50 hours of community service. Now you're not going to get any remuneration, financial remuneration for doing that. But in lieu of that, uh, if you don't want to do that, I'm going to send you to jail for six months or a year. Um, you want to make sure that that jurist has that flexibility and the system allows for that fact pattern to occur. So the ways that we're attacking that issue uh, is by either adding a section into the proposed new amendment, which would be in effect the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. and um, perhaps asking the Congress to consider statutory legislation that makes it abundantly clear what their intent is um, by uh, amending the Constitution, uh, what they intend to do and what they did not intend to do so that if it ever comes to a point of litigation going forward, there's a clear record, uh, both in the congressional record at the hearing stage and the debate surrounding the changing of the amendment itself, but also companion statutory language that makes it abundantly clear that we want to have a common sense system that isn't uh, that somebody can game for their uh, own immoral purposes, if I can use that word. Right. Yeah. So we're cautiously optimistic that for the first time, unlike, uh, you know, there are thousands of, of um, constitutional amendments that get introduced uh, since the country became uh, a nation. But we've only had 27 amendments and the first 10 were the Bill of Rights. So if you think, take the Bill of Rights out, the first 10, now we're down to 17. And one of those was the amendment on prohibition, which was then overturned. So that you're really down to a net of, of 16 amendments in the history of the country. So it's not a easy process and deliberately so. That's where the way the founding fathers uh, designed it. Mm -hmm. But um, we're hopeful that we'll get a, a hearing in both a formal hearing in the Senate and the House. And if that happens, we think there's enough goodwill in the Congress. Uh, you know, I, I can't believe, in, uh, and this happened to me when I was sworn into the military. When you're sworn into the military, or if you're sworn in to be a member of the Congress, or you're sworn in to be president of the United States, what do you, what do you swear to when you, hold, when you put your hand on the Bible? To uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. I don't think any of us ever thought for a moment that we were also, by doing that, you can't pick and choose. Well, I'll, 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 I'll swear to uphold the first four sections of the Constitution, but I'm not going to do the. No, it's a, it's an all or nothing thing, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think many of us or any of us thought that we're, we were swearing to uphold slavery in America. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, the website is freeatlastcoalition.org. I encourage you to go there and uh, uh, determine how you can be a part of this and uh, what are some ways people can be a part of this um, effort? Well, we're putting together a, a, a private network. We have a, a wonderful technologist who 
this will be a, a social media network that if you want to be part of it, um, initially, uh, we hope it'll be people who will not only pray for the, uh, what we're doing here, that God would bless it. Um, it's also a vehicle if people want to help us financially, none, nothing like this gets done without some financial resources. Uh, and we are a registered 501c3, so we're we're really an educational group to try to educate people about this this matter. Um, and potentially there will be a time where uh, we will ask people who are part of this network to perhaps reach out either through phone calls and or letters to members of Congress once it gets to the stage when it becomes more of a public issue rather than one that's uh, kind of percolating in the background right now. Um, so there is a, I think, a place to respond on our website, uh, freeatlastcoalition.org, if one goes up there. Uh, and if you provide this with an email address, a phone number, or both, um, we're pretty good about getting back to people. And that site will hopefully become more interactive in the next few months between now and the end of the year. Awesome. All right, Craig. Well, it's a, it's a, a big, uh, big goal, but a worthy goal. Thanks for uh, sharing with us uh, part of your story as well as uh, uh, a very important initiative. So thanks for being with us. Well, I want to thank you for your being such a gracious host and the invitation to share and I'll close by saying what a friend of mine has said to me repeatedly, Craig, you know, if the Lord is in this, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. And so that's kind of how we're operating. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for being with us. God bless. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Let's face it, we all want to make a difference. We want to live for Christ. We want our work to have meaning. Deep down, we all want to live a larger story, to make a difference in the world. But how do we do this? It doesn't just happen. We must invest in our spiritual and professional life. That involves spiritual mentoring and training. But where do we go to get that kind of spiritual mentoring and professional training? Is it a church? A conference? a school? The Change Agent Network is the answer to that question. Founded by Oz Hillman, he is a pioneer in the marketplace ministry and has had a 40-year advertising business career, working with clients like American Express, Steinway Pianos, and a host of other successful companies. He understands the challenge of living for Christ in a pressure-packed business environment. He created the Change Agent Network, to help leaders like you realize your dream of being successful in your career and having an influence on your world. The Change Agent Network is designed for you to realize your larger story, to understand your purpose, to learn to apply your faith life in your work life from Oz and other proven workplace leaders who are doing it. Our online courses will help you become God's change agent to be a cultural influencer, to succeed in your work life call, and to grow in your relationship with God and with other members of the Change Agent Network. Come join us. Let's influence the world together. MyChangeAgentNetwork.com